break for a moment and come back and they're all gone. Ten pages of notes. Hold up. Okay, Lord. Lord, did the enemy do that or did you do that? Are we supposed to change subjects? Because I, I really like to... I really like to follow the Lord. <laughs> Actually, I've done three messages today. <laughs> Trying to stay in step with him, you know. He speaks to me a lot sometimes. And, okay, is that what we're speaking on? And he just, well, listen, you know. And I, okay, I got, I got it. Oh, yeah, 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 we're going here. We're going there. Okay. And uh, I, I'm just a total peace. Even if I have no notes, I'm a total peace. Because if I have no notes, now there's even more opportunity that he might speak, huh? But he also speaks out of the midst of his great word. So you have it in front of you, Jude notes, which we can go into Jude. I, I, I feel like maybe we need to go somewhere else, and I don't know where that is. So we're just going to wait off in the shallow end of the pool and get our little floaties on and, and see where the Lord takes us. Are you all brave? <laughs> With that, I, I would like to ask, if you all don't mind, that you keep the stairs clear. And there's a reason for that. Uh, if someone needs to go up and down, if you have to get up while they're going up and down, then it causes a, a, a commotion of two people getting up and down. And then during worship, these two speakers are focused right towards that stairwell, and the guys can't hear back in the pit back there. So I have to stand there in that stairwell, listen to what needs to be turned up and what needs to be turned down. We constantly get a fluctuation of sound in here. And how many times do I tell you to turn up and down per, per session? <laughs> I just pick one. That's how much we have to adjust the sound. So I, I need to stand right in front of those stairs, not to hog the stairs, but that's where the sound meets and I don't hear the air conditioner so I can tell them what to do with the with the sound system. Now, it looks like you ladies are, would, would somebody, there's two rocking chairs back there in the back, would somebody get Misty and Linda those two rocking chairs, please? We don't want them sitting on the floor. We got plenty of seats. <clears throat> and anyway, uh, and then also, if, if you, if I'm there, I'm trying to listen to these speakers. So if you sing, would you not stand next to me? Because I'm hard of hearing, and if you're standing next to me, I'm trying to listen to the sound so I can adjust the sound, and I can't adjust the sound if you're close to me and I hear you singing. So, And I don't want to be isolated, please. <laughs> so, uh, so we will try to make more room in the back for those of you. I understand you want to stand in worship. I do. I want to stand in worship too. But the Lord has told me, he said, you have to keep your eyes open, Curtis. This is not your time. This is a time for my people. I want you to see what I'm doing. And so I try to stay in the flow of what the Spirit is doing to, to direct. That's what a shepherd's supposed to do is direct, is to lead the sheep, the music, everything, into the presence of God. And, and so I try to stay focused on, okay, what's the Spirit doing next? We had all kinds of distractions during the, during the worship this last time. There was a puff of smoke that some came from somewhere. And it was a lamp up there, I see. And and so somebody thought it was a projector, and they unplugged the projector, which that was a good thing. But then we we're having to check out the projector during that, and and I hope you still got into worship. Uh, <laughs> well, I I just I just got right back into worship after we got the projector back up and all that stuff. But there's all kinds of technical issues that are going on in the back back there that we have to resolve because we're we're recording music. One, we're making a master recording so that we can start playing this over the radio and we can also, you know, do some other things. And we're doing the uh, the internet broadcast and Tristan's running PowerPoint. So it's pretty complex back there. Uh, you ask me, why do we do all that? Well, all that has to do with ministry and worship. You know, there, I don't know if you know it or not, in the tabernacle they had works of service there and everybody had something to do with it. And why? <laughs> because he wanted to officiate God's presence. There was music leaders that had to get everybody to either memorize music or maybe they wrote it on a stick and held it in the air. I don't know, but if people are going to sing in unison, they have to be able to see it, don't they? So this is nothing new, and so I praise God for electronics because it's eliminated a lot of the problems that you used to have and just people not singing. 
it's brought forth a, a, a new, I want to say deeper worship. At one time, man really knew how to worship. It's because man knew how to sing. You go back a hundred years, everybody in our nation sung. Every family sung. The little kids sung. They they knew how to sing. They they they, they did. Even in the forties and fifties, you watch the movie. Everybody was singing, but they've lost the art of being able to sing. And in that, we're trying to recapture. So that's the reason why we do a lot of the technical stuff back there. Any comments or questions about that? Okay, moving right along. Then, why don't we pray? Are y'all good at prayer? <laughs> Y'all are praying for a message tonight, aren't you? <laughs> Lord, we humbly come before you. And how gracious you are and how delightful you are, Lord. We ask you just to wrap your arms around us and hold us tonight. Give us your comfort and your peace and your presence and your fellowship. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and speak to us. And oh, Lord Jesus, how we ask you for your great forgiveness washing, cleansing, your justification. Nothing we do are we justified. You're the only one that can justify us with our Lord God. We ask you for that justification. I ask you to impute your righteousness to us. The Holy Spirit, come and instruct us in our Master's great word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Isaiah chapter 58. You don't have to refer to your notes because it's not in there. <laughs> Isn't that nice? You can look at me. <laughs> Shout it aloud. Do not hold it back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. I look at the state of the church. I am seeking him out. But if I have hidden agendas and hidden sin, it's going to prevent me, even though I spent lots of my time seeking him out. I, I'm reminded when I was a kid, I, I used to live by Lake Murray in Ardmore, Oklahoma in high school. And, and I just, for, in southern Oklahoma, that was the only clean water lake that's in in the Texas Oklahoma area, other than Lake Travis, which Colorado River's on, and uh, it was uh, I'm going to say probably 20 miles long and had about three branches of uh, necks on it that were two to four or five miles wide, something like that. It was a big lake, clear water lake, in the rolling hills of southern Oklahoma, and it didn't have rivers that ran all the time, but in the spring, all the drainage from probably 40, 50 miles around, maybe 100 miles around, uh, drained into that that lake in three different creeks that were dry most of the year. But in the spring, we, we have some heavy rains there in Texas and Oklahoma, sometimes six inches in an hour. Uh, you want to see rain, I, I, uh, that's rain. Six inches in an hour is rain. <laughs> you just got to park under a bridge because you can't see the hood of your car. <laughs> You can't see the end of it. If you got a little decal on it with a light on it, you won't see it. The people just stop beside the road. So I, I used to really like spring because I would go out to the lake because the spillway would start going over. And the, when the spillway went over, there was this, the, the road across that went across the dam. It dipped down to the spillway, and you could drive across the spillway. And it's probably, I'm going to say, a quarter of a mile across the spillway. And so they made it wide intentionally because this is it, it, they get some real flooding in that area. And so the water starts going over the spillway. And when it does, every kid in town drives out there because you drive back and forth through the water. And it starts off as an inch deep. And it starts off, then it's two inches deep. And then, you know, a couple of days later, it's three inches deep. And you get some big storms. And, and if it starts getting over six inches deep, you don't want to drive across there anymore. Because those cars just get washed right down the creek. Now, because it's so wide, there's shallow water that you can have a lot of fun in. There's fish coming by, just being dumped out of that lake. For some reason, the fish want out of that lake, and they're just coming over by the thousands going down the creek. So I, I used to love to go out there when the water's about two inches deep because nobody had interest in the two-inch deep water. Now, when I look at us and our relationship with Jesus, we, 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 we're seeing 
uh, corporately, we're saying, oh, there's Jesus, and we're looking about two inches deep a long way, right? There's not a lot you can get wet in in, in our Christian society out there right now. It's just two inches deep. You can splash, you can kick in it, and now you didn't want to lay down because the road was kind of, you know, moss grew on it, and it, it was kind of slick. <laughs> and even though it was clear water, that was not the place. Now, unfortunately, uh, that clear water, as it ran on down, it kind of it, it crashed over some huge rocks, and then there was a there was a cliff that went over about twenty feet off of those rocks down onto more rocks, and then there was stair stepping waterfalls, and that quarter of a mile, two inches deep, eventually started getting narrower and narrow and narrower within about three blocks of the spillway. And why I'm telling you this is because most of our days we spend up there in that shallow water trying to seek God and, and you, 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 all you're going to get is two inches you can't fully get submerged in him but something I found out was I began to climb rocks and climb hills to get past all those cliffs and stuff to see where that creek ran to and what happened to that two inches of water that two inches of water narrowed down and narrowed down and narrowed down until finally it was about as wide as this room. And it was a nice river. And then it would split with islands in it. And then I found, as I went down about a mile, that, that it, all of a sudden you got into some real droppage, 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 and it was cutting through sandstone rock. And there was chasms that were probably, I'm going to say, six feet deep that water was shooting through there for maybe a half a mile. And you could jump off in that and you'd woo -woo, I mean, it was a blast. And then as I went on down, I found this one place that I loved to go. It was my favorite place to go. It's where that river panned out again for about, I'm going to say probably 100 feet, something like that. And so now it's probably about six inches, and it's just sheer cliff that the water's running off of a rock. And it was a huge pool and was surrounded by huge boulders that had been washed down. And you had to really hunt to find that pool. And that pool was a deep, deep pool that the torrent of water went into. But I found out when there was two inches coming over the spillway, you couldn't get in that because the water was too rough. But when there's one inch going over the spillway, now you could go down, dive in that pool, swim over, and there was rocks, that were, there was a flat levee area, and you could get up and sit under those rocks with that water just pouring over you. There was a cave behind the waterfall, of course. And I found deeper and deeper water because the water was squeezed together. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for the place that all the presence of God can be squeezed into so we can begin to experience Him. Instead of just playing in the two inches of water, and a lot of people really busted their rears and broken arms and stuff on that spillway because it was concrete. And after that water ran for a while, it was slick as snot. And that's pretty slick. <laughs> if you're from Texas, you'll appreciate that. If you're from the Northwest, where we're at, you may not understand that saying. <laughs> that's where we sometimes want to stand and try to run and play with God. In the two inches of water, we don't have the stability that we need because the ground underneath it has, it's got a cake of something. See, it's, it's, it, there's, there's stuff growing under there. There's not enough torrent and water just to wash it on off. You know, if you had water going 200 miles an hour through there, enough sand would get through there and it'd wash and keep it clean and it'd be rigid and it'd be a good place to stand. Now, that, that's the problem with, with water that stands too much. Algae grows in it fast moving water algae don't grow in it's why you can get up in the mountains and it's really crashing down it cleanses itself as it's coming down you can put it in impurities a mile upstream and if it's a rough riding river it's cleansed it cleansed itself a mile down river so rougher water although it looks more dangerous it's deep it's plentiful and it will cover the whole person and wash the whole person but if you want to get down there, you've got to explore. You've got to follow the channel of water until it narrows. And you're going to make some delightful discoveries in God's word, in his presence, and in his fellowship as a result of leaving the mundane where just the water is two inches deep. 
Those are our choices and our decisions in seeking our God. Our God is waiting. Our God is calling us. And like this statement here in Isaiah 58, that he's, he, he begins to say, You seem eager to know my ways. He says, you, 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 For day you seek me out. If, if we want to get into those deep waters, it takes more than a day. It takes all of our all of our perseverance of life to seek God. If we don't seek Him with all of our hearts, He's watching to seek. What, what, what's your motive? Oh, yeah, you just want me to take care of your problems. I'd be like your children coming to you and knocking on your door. Hey, uh, uh, you know, I, I want to get an ice cream cone. Uh, can I have ice cream cone? Can I have ice cream cone? Can I have ice cream cone? Now, I know your kids didn't do that. <laughs> I know you didn't do that. And when it comes to a bicycle, can I have a bicycle? Please, 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 please. Yeah, you didn't do that, right? In our relationship with God, I find for the most part, we're, we're approaching God under those guys out of our desperate needs. We need to get close enough to God that we can get our needs met and that we can get on down past the slippery area into his presence and sit. I used to take a, a backpack and some sandwiches and drapes down that thing and, and I would I would I would get there early in the morning because it's hot hot there in southern Oklahoma in the summertime and I would spend all day down there. It really was a great place. I would listen to the roar of the water. I would pray. I, I it was it was solitude. It was it was heavenly. It was it reminded me of the scripture that talked about the river of life pouring over it. it. It was a constant reminder. Although I was a young pup, I still had a deep love for my Lord. It really came alive when I went and got in the river. And I found out that river wouldn't, you couldn't take canoes down it. <laughs> you, you, kayaks wouldn't have made it down this. Because it would, it would break into shallow. It's too shallow for them. It would, it would, it would kill somebody trying to go down in a kayak. Now I grant you later on, when, when it was down where I'm talking about swimming, a kayak could have done fine. But you didn't have been dead before you got there. So, <laughs> and that's part of the problem. See, we want to go to deep water. We're told about deep water, but I had to climb several hills and ranges to come back around from another direction to get to where this pool was. I couldn't just follow the water down. It was too treacherous. The rocks were. The water wasn't. Now, if that spillway was going over two feet, you didn't even want to get close to it. <laughs> You'd be in China somewhere. Real quick. <laughs> and not in one piece. Actually, it might be a good thing for you. You'll get to your Lord quicker if you did that. <laughs> Uh, I, he goes on in Isaiah chapter 58, and they seem eager for God to come near them. Why have they fasted? God's asking that question. They say, and you have not seen it. In other words, they're saying, oh God, I, you know, I've, I've, been, I've been seeking you. I've, I've been doing the things to, to seek you, and, and, and you haven't seen it. And, and, and why did I waste my time being humble for a couple of days? And, and you didn't take notice. Yet on the day of your fast, this is God speaking to you, you do as you please. <coughs> See, fasting is not a point of doing without food. Fasting is a point of finding God's pleasure and finding God's will and laying yourself out prostate and, not, and stopping from all the things that would offend him. All actions and voices. Do you realize that, that you, know, I mean, it, it, you know, my wife can do something I don't like and I can, you know, give her a stare and... and and, 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 and uh, she could stare back. <laughs> you realize if the Lord is in the room and he catches a glimpse of haughtiness in someone's eyes, he leaves. He doesn't accept that behavior in heaven and the celestial beings. So if we're truly seeking our God, there's got to be peace in all of our relationships. Matter of fact, it says if you have aught against your brother, and 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 or if there's some sort of offense there, that and you bring a gift to the altar, just leave your gift right there and go settle the matter. Get it out of the way before you come and stand before me, because see, he sees what's stuck inside you. He sees the anger, and the animosity, and the hate, and the bitterness, and all that stuff. And we come down. Okay, I'm gonna fast and live closer to the Lord. I'm up there. I'm laying down in that two inches of water, trying to trying to get it 
and then all of a sudden the water level drops and there's a quarter of an inch running by, you know. And the crawdads come out and start hanging on your ears. And you went, why? I, I, I'm breaking my neck here trying to get to you, God. And he said, you don't have the right heart. You know, do you want your kids to be sour and south when you come and you want to play with them and you want to fellowship with them? No, you don't. So the first thing, first rule, if you want to get down in that some of that deeper water, because God's the one that has to show you the pathways of how to get there. So, see, i, I got to be pleasing enough to him that he's going to come and show me where those hidden pathways are. They're going to lead me down to where these springs are. And if I'm not pleasing to him and all of my actions and deeds amongst men, because there's where he's watching. Are you just faking it and saying you want to get religious and get closer to me so you can benefit? Or you really want to become pleasing to me and my child? He, Jesus, he wanted, he, he wanted to be pleasing to his father. He said it was even written about him in the volume in heaven that he came to do his father's will. And his father's will was that he would be the most joyous man on planet earth jesus was consummately the most joyous person on planet earth no one's ever had more joy than he had why it's not because of his humble circumstances it wasn't because he got to work in the carpenter shop with real tools oh it wasn't for any other reason other than he was aware spiritually conscious of his father God and he could look up and oh father what would you like done today have open conversations with him and embrace him and God the father would speak to him you know, oh my son you know I, I, I get the the king's maid coming over and she's going to need a table and he's been starving her to death and would you go ahead and build her a table oh yes father he starts away and he puts such craftsmanship in it did you know somewhere on planet earth I wouldn't doubt that there's some furniture that was made by Jesus somewhere sitting either in some museum or back of somebody's house wouldn't that be an amazing thing when he returns and he, he says uh, you know hey uh, that person over there did y'all know I built that table when I was here on earth I'm going to be the first one to run over there and look at it and think oh my goodness look at the craftsmanship hand they didn't have use wax and things like that to polish they hand rubbed stuff to polish wood to get the finishes that we get today that's after they've already hand carved it so our our lord is a master craftsman and if and if he built furniture that's still standing which i hope your thought process can go there and our god can do that can he and he can reserve those things do you think that would be precious to his father to keep the things that he made here on earth I'm telling you, if it was my son and I was God the Father, there's nothing my kid made on earth that wouldn't be in storage somewhere <laughs> to go on display in the heavens, right? To show all the angels. See, he did it as a man. He was. I remember when he built that little bitty rocking chair. He said, would you bring that thing here? Would you look at this thing? I mean, he was three and a half years old. rocks perfect I mean God was pleased with his son his son that was a man here on earth doing man activities here on earth Jesus realized that he needed to please his father in fact when he was 12 he, he tried to go in to the temple and thinking I don't, I don't know if you know they got this bar mitzvah thing that, that you're, you're under your mother's care she is the official authority over your life until you reach 13th the end of your 12th year and then you are officially transferred to your father's care to begin your apprenticeship under your father but until then you serve in the house you learn your mother's wisdom she pours into you everything that there is he shows you how the household is run how a wife is supposed to act how a mother's supposed to act she trains you in 
in being a part of the household and part of the family. What Jesus, he said, oh, oh, he's thinking, you know, I served 12 years doing this, and now I'm, I'm here in Jerusalem, and they, they went to Jerusalem, you remember, and, and, and they lost Jesus. He, they got about probably 70 people with them, a big entourage and a lot of relatives running around there, and, and they head back home, and, and on the way they realize Jesus is not with them, and they, oh, my goodness, he's not here. Let's go back and look for him. And they go back and look and look and look, and, and, and somebody in the tribe there got a little bit wise and said yeah, let's check the temple <laughs> you know I remember that he, he heard the voice that said he was the son of God <laughs> you think he's there and they go there and he's there and the priests are sitting listening to him teach had never heard such wisdom as what scripture records they have never heard such wisdom in the temple that came from a 12 year old his parents challenge him and say, uh, Son, why have you done this to us? Don't you know, you're supposed to come back and, and, and be with us. They, well, I, I, I thought you would know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm reached that age. I'm, I'm not under my mother's care. I'm, 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 about, I'm supposed to be about my father's business, aren't I? Well, see, what, God, what pleased God was he sent him down here, and Jesus was supposed to go serve as a man. Do it the way we have to do it. No shortcuts. No becoming Mr. Religious Guru guy that impresses every. No, you've got to go back if you want to be pleasing to the Father. I'm sure he probably registered with his father right quicker. But, uh, father, uh, am I supposed to? I thought I was supposed to be about your business. And he, he said, oh, I, I sent you to be a man. Now, I want you to go live it until you become a man. I want you to live uprightly before me and honest before me filled with truth and filled with life and filled with joy so that when, when you stand here before me and when you when it's time for you to start your ministry, you have done and lived a life exemplatory in absolute perfection before me so they can stand as a model in heaven and upon earth that a man really accomplished being at peace and full of joy in all the hard circumstances that life can bring. And I'm sure he said, well, sure, Father, I'll go do that. And so he goes back, and somewhere along the way, his father dies, not on the trip, but somewhere back in his home. And he's got brothers and sisters, and he's the oldest, and he takes the father's place and becomes the man that takes care of the family, the man that provides for the family, the man that keeps the carpenter business going. Bill's probably a really flourishing business because what was his charge? To go back and do that, right? And this, this is Jesus. He's no slough off. Whatever God put before him to do, he did with all his might. So if he called him to be a child to his parents, he was a child of delight to his parents. If he called him to be a man, he became a man and did everything pleasing in his lifestyle to God. So Jesus came and gave us the example that everything we do is supposed to be pleasing to him. These people that we're reading about here in Isaiah 58 it's us the Holy Spirit declares to us our rebellion saying don't you know when you're angry when you're stuffed shirt when you want your way you're, you're in rebellion and it's enough rebellion that the Holy Spirit doesn't come close now, I, I know you're doing religious things thinking if you perform this fast and do without that you know, banana chocolate sandwich that you're really impressing me, but it, it, it doesn't impress me. I'm looking at things of the heart within you, and you're not at peace. You're not filled with joy. Your purpose is not to have fellowship with me. If it was to have fellowship with me, you would realize you need to put on the garments of praise to approach me. You need to have joy in your confidence. There needs to be purpose in your heart expectation of coming and meeting with the mighty God in your midst. Come and fellowship with him. They say, that, or you say, why have we humbled ourselves? Yet on the day of your fasting you do as you please. And you exploit those who are under you. Ooh. See, God's standing there watching. You, you said it. God, 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 I, I, I want a special meeting. I need you. I need so much direction in my life. Will you, will you come down here? Will you come down here? And then he, he comes and, and you're over there doing without your peanut butter, banana, chocolate, raspberry cham sandwich and with potato chips on it. 
and and we eat weird stuff. See, we're 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 saying we're doing without out something that's absolutely wonderful. And the reason I'm giving you an odd description like that is because that's what God looks at it and says, you're giving that up and thinking you're moving closer to me? I don't think so. He said, I was standing there when you and you began to exploit those who are under you. I watched that. And even in your fast, it just ends in quarreling and strife. And you said you want me to come close. Matter of fact, you even end up striking each other with wicked fists. I, I want you to know our tongue can get in a ball knot that looks like this. And it just flattens people sometimes. Our tongue can be a sharp sword to keep people away that we fence with. And if we've got it sticking out of our mouth, fencing with it, we've already run the Holy Spirit off. I don't know if y'all saw Edward Scissorhands, the guy with the, you know, we're, we're, we're Edward Scissortongue, cutting each other to ribbons, and the Holy Spirit sees that and said, you said you wanted me to come close. I'm sorry, I, I don't like Scissortongue people. I'm leaving. So he's calling us, and so he begins to ex express to us that you can't expect your voice to be heard on high. And he says, I, I think this kind of, this is the kind of fast that I've chosen for you. Matter of fact, the fast that you choose, is it one that just for humbling yourselves and just bowing like a reed, like, okay, I bow to you. Because, you know, the, the Hebrews would stand in front of the wall and they would, they would bow and rock back and forth and bow and, oh, and recite some psalms and recite some hymns and stuff. And Jesus says, I, I don't need you weaving back and forth in front of me. I, I want you to stand still and upright before me and be truthful and honest and kind and full of peace. See, I, I, when he came, he came to do the Father's will, and that brought everything around him under subjection to his Father, which is peace. It's not a cessation of events. It's all things work in accordance with God's will for your life. Everything worked in accordance with God's will for Jesus. He gave us the model that everything's supposed to we be that way for us. And he goes on to say, he, he said, and it's not for you to go put on sackcloth and ashes. I meet lots of Christians, and, and you know, they would look better with some ashes on them. They'd cover some of their, um, seeking you He would run. He's looking for somebody that joyously desires him, that hungers for him, that is thrilled about him, that wants him, that wants to climb up in his lap, look in his eyes with stars in him and say, Oh, Daddy, Daddy, hold me, hold me. Remember the scripture that says, Abba, Father. That's, that's what that means. Is, Daddy, Daddy, hold me. He, he, is that your responses in the way you approach God? Because he's giving us instructions about how to approach him. Then he goes on to say, he says, is not this the kind of fast? Here, here's what I've chosen for you. If you want to be pleasing to me, he said, to loose the chains of injustice. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah show, me, show me somebody that's doing bad out there. I'll just go out there and I'll, I'll cut their chains in two and I, I'm going to straighten out and, you know, do I need to become an attorney to do this? Do I need to be a lawyer? And it, no, 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 no. Those, those chains of injustice are chains that you put on other people. See, we like to control, manipulate one. Oh, we gotta push! I gotta push you in a box and get you to do it my way. And if you're not doing it my way, I just go absolutely ballistic. Mouth runs a hundred miles an hour. You've got to do it my way. And if you don't do it my way, it's not God's way. And I'm I'm telling you, one of the biggest problems within Christendom is our personal preferences. And if you don't meet my personal preference, all of a sudden I'm going to call it sin. If I don't meet your personal preference, then you call it sin. But sin's recorded in the Bible of what sin is and that's before God too many people get their personal preference involved in Christianity Jesus had no personal preference other than what is your will my Lord? I'll do it he didn't try to inflict his will on anyone did he he didn't try to come in and crush down other people to be under him he never tried to do that 
And they renounced him, denounced him when they kicked him out of synagogues. And they tried to stone him. He just walked away. He didn't rail at them. He didn't fight with them. He was a man of peace. So he said, this is the kind of fast I've chosen. That you humble yourself. That you loose the chains of injustice. And untie the cords of the yoke. See, there's other people in our lives that we put yokes on their necks and we make them carry certain load. I expect this of you. Husbands do that to wives. Wives do that to husbands. Husbands and wives do that to children. Children do that to mothers and fathers. Whoa. There's a bad one. But that's one of the things Scripture says is that the children will begin to put great burdens upon the parents in the last days. It says it in different words, but we're supposed to untie whatever and whoever we have tied up with my want, my will, my directives. It's got to be, and if you don't get your way, then you, you pout, you get angry, you go silent, you give the silent treatment, you do the cold shoulder, you do the stares. How about the flipping eyes? You know, like if you're my boss and you tell me to do something and I know I can't say anything, but I go, oh. Holy Spirit just saw that. He withdraws. He says, now, I thought you said you wanted to, me to walk with you at work today. I thought you said you wanted me to be there. You, that, that, I, I can't be there if you're going to be like You have to do it like Jesus did it. Let's be filled with peace and have so much desire for me. Because remember, here's what we get. If we meet with him, he can show us the secret paths that carries us down to deeper water, right? Do, do you want to get down to deeper water where he's at? You want to get there where the waters of his presence are just cascading and washing over you? I used to sit for hours under that and then just push myself out in that deep pool and swim around in that deep pool. There was a big rock out there in the middle of that pool. The pool was about as big as this room with the waterfall the size of the end of this room. And it was sheer cliffs going up all around with the exception of the exit. It was wonderful. It's like isolation in the river of God with him there. He offers that. He said, you know, I'll show you these trails and pathways of how to get there. It's too treacherous if you try to do it on your own. But there's a way I can move you around down to this deeper, deeper stuff. So he says not only that, but we're supposed to break every yoke. Once we get the yoke off, we're supposed to set the oppressed free. In other words, I'm not going to go round you back up and make you my slave. Because now if I just do it for a day, he said, now, did, did you just plan on doing this for a day? Or do you want to stay in right standing? What he's saying is I expect, once you make the decision to be in my presence, I expect you to stay in right relationship with me. Break that yoke. Give up your right to control others. Give up your right to get the last word in. Give up. Matter of fact, think of this. You can have your last word and the vengeance that goes with it. Or you can retract your sword and say, Lord, I surrender that word to you because I desire your presence. They say, ah, good decision, good decision, good decision. And a peace will stay upon you. The Lord will come close to you. And he began to give you the secrets to the stairs that lead you. There was a place called Turner Falls, and I, I remember finding one time a set of stairs because the way you used to get into this they had built an entrance that, that came into it but used to you come off the top of a high cliff mountain and they had cut stones out in the side of the mountain that you traversed down for two miles to get into the bottom of that canyon where Turner Falls was they did put up a handrail I went down it and there was a sign that said you're not supposed to go this way <laughs> little bit of rebellion in me but the waterfall was calling <laughs> it was an attractive nuisance is what they call it in the legal area he says if we do these things verse 8 and then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear do you need healing are you are you all tangled up in life with others and things he says, if we do these things, then the light will break forth. The light of seeing him. 
See, when Jesus steps forth on the scene, there's a brilliant light of him coming close. And as he comes close, then there's healing. And it quickly appears that healing does. All the wounds of the heart that you have, all the distresses of the mind that you have, when we stand in the light of his full presence, his glory brings completeness. His glory brings stableness to the mind brings real sincere peace in him is the answer in him is the light and I don't need to be exposed to the light and go back to where I was I need to stay in the light don't I and as I stay in the light then healing overtakes me it says it quickly appears and then righteousness will go before you oh wow now there's a biggie right there because one thing we're always whining about, we know how unrighteous we are. But if I'm with Jesus, and I'm staying in step with Him, and I'm following Him wherever He's going, guess what's going before Him? <coughs> His righteousness. I get on a path of pure righteousness that's pleasing to my God as a result of staying in step with Him. And little do I know in that light and in those steps he's leading me down through the hills and through the canyons to get me into where the deep water is at so I can rest and I can stay there and I can drop my feet in it I can swim in it I can be covered in it I can have an experience that is an ongoing experience all day long the hot hot summer times that my mom worked and I would leave early in the morning and get on my little scooter and and go out there to Lake Murray and 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 uh, and just just want to run and and go find these paths and trails that would lead me down to these places. Your God is waiting to take you there, because when He does that, He now He's appeared, He's brought healing, and it, His healing quickly appeared, and then your righteousness will go before you. Your righteousness, why? When Jesus is there, he makes you righteous. Do you want to feel righteous? It's a marvelous thing to feel washed and cleansed and righteous before your God. It's a, it's a breathtaking feeling inside, not only to know that he's cleansed you, but to know that you're responding rightly. Something happens inside the soul when I know I am in right standing with my God. Not out of what he has done, but because I've been obedient. It brings joy that floods the soul. It's uncomprehendable. It's where Jesus got his joy from, was being obedient to his Father. At that point in time, it says that the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. And the glory of God, we've talked about that. Remember the tabernacle when it was built? And the glory of God stood above it, this tornadic fire that went all the way up into the heavens. That's the glory of God. It says right here, if you are with Jesus on that path and following him down and staying in that light and he's brought healing to you and he's brought righteousness to you, the next thing you can expect is to turn around and see the fiery glory of your God walking behind you. Not in front of you, behind you. Jesus is supposed to be in front of you. God the Father in his glory is behind you. <laughs> Isn't that delightful? Now, what do you think people would think if you're walking down to the path of the river and they see Jesus walking in front of you in a glory cloud, hallelujah, shouting behind you, fire, tornadic fire, and they go, wow, where's that person going? <laughs> you know? That's a, that draws people's attention. They, they want, I want what that guy's got. You know? Not scurvy. Something filled with joy, life, peace. When we're that away. He says, then you will call upon the Lord and he will answer you. Do you need him to answer? You will cry out and he will say, here I am. That's a profound statement for God to say to you, to me, here I am. I sometimes forget how to get down to the pathways. And I think God intentionally changes the pathways. So I have to go to him for him to lead me there they change the location of the pool changes frequently reason being is he wants me to know if you're going to go without me it's going to be a dry mud hole when you get there <laughs> I'm the only one that's going to lead you there son 
I've been, I, I want you to know, I've been back to the dry mud hole many times. Noodled a few fish while I was in there. But it was still a dry mud hole. The Lord will guide you always. Matter of fact, he makes a statement. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, now that's the third time he's talked about our yoke of oppression. With the pointing finger and the malicious talk, Oh, we're good at malicious talk. It's amazing that even when Scripture's coming forth, I open the end of the meeting for discussion. Amazing, some people will leave and they'll go out, oh, I don't know about that, what do you think? Well, you had a chance to ask the question here. When you go out and you cast doubt in somebody else's heart because of your own troubles and own rebellion and own frustration, you had a chance to express before your God any doubt that you had, any fear that you had. We're supposed to give up malicious talk. Especially when it comes about scripture of tripping someone else up with our opinions about our personal preferences. We don't think this is of God. We don't think that is of God. That's personal preference. If it's in scripture, it's of God. Just because it's pink and you want it blue, that's personal preference. I'm telling you, if you want your God to walk with you, he watches for malicious talk. He watches it, first of all, in his house to see when you leave what comments you make about his presence, what comments you make about his responses, what comments you make about the things you don't like. It's funny to me that sometimes 20 people can be touched and two or three might leave and I didn't get a thing out of it. You get anything out? I don't know about that. I don't know about that doctrine and that doctrine. And and they go start talking to one another about that behind the scenes. Shouldn't we have those conversations here so that the enemy doesn't use what you have to say to defeat somebody else in their relationship with their God? Oh, we plant so many seeds of unrest and those who we want to bring to Christ. You know, when, when you're at unrest with, uh, with the word that's being given to you, I've met many people that go out and make a comment to a brother or sister. Frustrated. And then maybe a year later, they're back on fire and on the same page. And they're trying to convince that person to come closer to the Lord trying to convince that person to come sit in Jesus' presence. And that person, all they can remember is, hey, I remember when you told me you didn't believe that. I remember when you told me something was wrong. I remember when you, I remember, I remember. We disqualify people from coming to God. We disqualify them from coming and sitting in His presence. And oh my goodness, His Spirit is here. How many, has there anyone that you've disqualified from coming when there was something you were disgruntled about? Malicious talk in the midst of God's presence is not something that we should do if we want to hold His presence and want that pathway. Remember, we want to, go, we want to get down to the water. We want to see Him. We want to hear Him. We want, we want to know Him. And He's telling us that, that here, here's what's tripping you up. <laughs> These are pretty simple things. All you got to do is just close this. And if there's a disagreement within you, haven't I made a way for us to talk about those things? Shouldn't you be at peace in my presence instead of trying to control or manipulate? Shouldn't, you, shouldn't there be peace? Isn't that what you come for? Don't you want to see me? Don't you want to know me? Uh, I hate to belabor this for you. I want you to get down to the pool. And this is what prevents you from getting to the pool. Now, we can take this a further step. I've just used the house of God as an example. Let's go to our homes in that setting, your Lord follows you, and he says, you, you're calling on him. Oh, God, the house is on fire. Help, help, come. <laughs> and he comes, and he says, oh, you call on me? Yes, yes, oh, you're here, Lord. And then you turn around, and, and you, you, you give somebody, I remember being in Honduras, and the and the way the men treated their wives down there, when they wanted something, they looked at the wives, and they go, <laughs> you know, <and> go, whoa, <laughs> let me out. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> they make all kinds of weird noises. And I think, whoa, what is that? <laughs> yeah, they're constantly writing and 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 prevailing, and, uh, and and that's part of their culture down there. And I thought, oh Lord, what a shame! What a shame that they're taught that's the way to treat another human being, because these were men that were supposed to be men of God. These were men that were supposed to be on their faces serving God, but they hadn't learned one of the first principles that was to love your wife as yourself. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. And how does Christ love the church? Unconditionally. With his arms wrapped around you. Coming in constantly and covering our shame. Coming in constantly and wooing us. He's never had to be angry with me and stick his fist in my face and say, you're going to do it my way. He's never been hostile towards me. I can make him quiet sometimes. I have ticked him off a couple of times, but he didn't stick around to let me know how bad it was. And then I went without him for a season and I began to call upon him again and call upon him again. And there's a passage of scripture that says, call on me, call on me, and I will show you great and mighty things. Some people have asked me, well, how did you have all those experiences? I was calling on him. Oh, God. God, I am so delighted. I am calling on you. I would stand out and I would call and call. All day long I would be calling. People, if they're bombarding me, I didn't pay attention. I didn't get my saddle out right. I didn't get my spurs out. I'm standing calling on my God. Not because the house is on fire, but because I've seen him. He is brilliant. He is full of light. He is my joy. He is my hope. He is everything to me, and I'm calling on him because I'm waiting for that next meeting. I'm wanting that next meeting. Every day, it's time for a new meeting. I can't go on what I received yesterday. If I try to make it a week without seeing him, I just dry up like toast, dust. She could blow off like pollen. Just fall apart have to have meetings with him and those meetings are only arranged if I meet his conditions of being his bride that starts in the heart and humility of coming and laying my life before him and saying here I am Lord would you wash me and cleanse me and forgive me I'm not going to do that in front of you anymore see we don't get the mindset that Jesus wants to walk and abide with us if he's going to abide with you, do you realize the body language speaks more than words do? Body language. I can look my wife in the eye and I can say, yeah, I love you. What did I tell her? And she comes up to me and, oh, honey, will you, will you just put your arms around? Yeah, when I get time, I, I, I'll get to that. Don't, don't forget now, I love you. Just bear up. Come on, get with the program. Is the Holy Spirit staying around in there? He's not. Do any angels address each other that way? No, they don't. <laughs> so God's whole point to us is to let us know, look, I don't put a yoke upon you. You're the one that has to come if you want my yoke and put your head in it. I don't put it on you. I don't put any burdens upon you. I'm not a control freak that has to control every move that you make and every breath that you make. Oh, my goodness. We would just split open. Our minds would go bonkers if, if he tried to oppress us. Our God is not an oppressive God, and he does not use control tactics to oppress us. The, 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 you know who, who is a control tactic freak? Satan is. And if we're practicing his methods... We're doing His will and not our Father's will. And we can't get the path because we can't get to, into the meeting. We've got to get pleasing enough that we get into the meeting, right? Because in that meeting, He says, follow me. Oh, you've been so pleasing to me. I've been watching you. You purposely, within your heart, made yourself delightful and you took the yoke off these people and you untied them. Do you, do you know how delight... How would you feel if you walked in and your six-year-old son had 40 yards of, of 
of, 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 of nylon string and had that puppy tied up so tight that the puppy's all bound and duct tape around his nose so he couldn't squeal to tell anybody and ears taped down and, and eyes propped open and he's sitting there, I said, look at me, look at me, look at me. Now, how do you feel about that? You got a child you're going to have to deal with? We do that to people. We tie them, we bind them with our burdens, with our mind, with our hearts. We're trying to control them using those methods. They're offensive. It'd be, you would really have a worry on your hands if you came here and found your child doing that. Now, what if you find him taking matches and sticking it close to the dog's nose and burning the end of his nose? Are you going to be upset about that? Well, your fiery tongue does that to people. You tie them up, you make them, you listen to me. Get that match out and just right on their nose. And God watches it. He says, I don't like this. If you want to find out where my pool is, you're going to have to stop doing these things. My son stopped doing these things because he never did these things because he wanted in my presence. I sent him as an example for you. So if if we want these meetings, we've got to come into this mindset. And if we do this, it says the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun scorched land. He will strengthen your frame. He will you will be like a well watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Do you want to be in a well watered garden whose springs never fail? Your people will rebuild ancient ruins. Oh, I love that. I had a brother that called me in. He recently bought a fifth wheel trailer that was an ancient ruin. <laughs> Got it home and he was delighted with it and, and still is. But there was one problem. It had this slide out that's about 20 feet long that slides out of it. And he noticed that there was a little rot over in the corner. And he said, what do I do about this? You know, I need to change, change this. And I said, well, you know, check it out. And he checked out. Well, I found more rot. I found the floor was rotted. And I found the wall was rotted. And then I found the next wall was rotted. And I found the roof is rotted. And, and everything on there but one board was rotted. I told him, I said, well, you know, begin to just take it apart. Went over, said, you got to strip this inside skin off first. And you got to, and, and when you strip the inside skin, maybe we can just replace some of the studs and tie it. Because you got to have a good foundation under it. This is the slide out. There's only two beams that hold it up. And all the floor is rotted out. The walls are rotted out. And it's all hidden. He did not when he bought it. I'm telling you this is because there's much rot underneath the surface of our lives. Moldy, mildew, musty. It doesn't smell very good. Makes you want to run. See, Jesus looks for rot. I don't know if you know it, but one of the one of the official jobs of a priest was a mold inspector. You know, you have mold. <laughs> he was supposed to come to your house at least once a year and inspect, see if you had mold. If you had mold, he told you how to get it out. They'd go in and treat the house and 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 sterilize it and all that stuff and replace some of the stones and and whatever it took. It had to be out. If you came back again and you didn't get rid of it, then the house was to be torn down. All the stones would be carried out into an unclean place and buried. Isn't that a strange song for a priest? And do you realize mold is something that it feeds on other real things? It's it's like the, the it's like our hate. Our our will. Mold is, is like I'm wanting to control you. I just spread mold all over you. When I do, everything begins to rot. Well, I, I went over and, and, and looked at it and, and finally said, well, you know, this has got to come off this kind. And when he got it all stripped down, I went back and looked at it and, and I thought, it's all got to come out. All of it. <gasps> what are we going to do? <laughs> you know, I, that's, a, that's a pretty big job to you're going to rip all the walls, all the ancient walls that are rotted and molded out. But that's 
when we become pleasing to him and we release the yokes and we stop pointing the finger, you, 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 I want this done, you, 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 then Jesus enables us to be a restorer of ancient wounds. A restorer. I went over and helped my brother restore that. But my first requirement was you get it all torn out. I don't want any pieces in the hole when I come. What is Jesus' requirement? If you want him to come and help you restore, you get it all torn out. And he offered to help over in the other chapter. He offered to help us. So he, he didn't, he's not leaving you on your own in this. He is giving us opportunity to be be called repairer of broken walls. I, I get to be called a repairer of a broken wall this week. <laughs> and ceiling. And floors. <laughs> and everything else that was in there. <laughs> but I promise you when the rest of the trailer falls down, that's going to keep standing. Oh, if we do these things, I love Isaiah chapter 40. Because now we're getting in a position that our God really likes us. And he begins to make this declaration. Oh, comfort. Comfort the love of my life, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And proclaim to her. Her hard service has been completed. See, the hard service is us trying to control, us trying to manipulate, us trying to use hate, us trying to use anger. You know, all those are, are they're forms of communication to get our will. They're forms of communication to get our way. So we just need to stop that form of communication and take on the new form of communication that Jesus used. Do you realize that Satan uses communication He's called the father of lies. It's, it's a form and a language. If we're being deceptive in our language, trying to manipulate one another, we're using the language of lies that Satan knows that he's the master of and he's the father of. We're his agent, acting as his agent. And the Lord said, Oh, wait a minute now. I, don't be his agent. Come on now. I died for you. I redeemed you. I poured out my blood for you. I stop being his agent. You don't have to join his team. My team's on this side. They wear pure white robes. There's no one on my volleyball team over here that comes in with this, this huge grizzly bear uniform to try to scare the other team or try to get the other teammates to be in their, their spot, that they're going to be the king of the, of the volleyball. There's no one that does that on my court. Do you want to be on his court? Because he's saying, he said, come on, I want you to be a team member. So he says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed. See, when we're involved in being Satan's agent, sin is there. And we reap the wages of our sin. Yeah, that's what the scripture says. If you sin, you're going to reap those wages. Those wages are tough. They're tough wages. That means if I put out hostility, I get back, what is it? 30, 60, or 100 fold. And some people wonder, why is that person so hard to me? <laughs> we should just get out of my face. <laughs> and they keep, they keep bringing a steamroller in and run over you, you know. And you, How can they do that? <laughs> well, it's because you're putting out some venom. And your Lord Jesus is there, and he's saying, if you're going to do that, I'm leaving. And if he's gone, you're in trouble. The only time I ever get steamrolled is when he's not there. <laughs> and I'm like those little cartoon figures, you know, when you just flatten down, you like that. And then, Jesus! <laughs> he comes over and you poof, back up, you know, and you all fill out. You know, I love the cartoons. <laughs> so he goes on to say, matter of fact, he says, you'll pay double for your sins. And he says, but there's a voice of one calling in the desert place. That's, that's where you and I are, in the desert. It's prepare the way for the Lord. Make your life peace, your heart full of peace. Prepare the way for Him to come, for you to have a meeting with Him. The spillway is going over, is it not? There's water available, is there not? Do you want to get down into those deep holes with Him? 
He says, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. See, that your life is the wilderness, and you're the one that has to make a decision. I've got to move everything out of this path. It's a straight path to him. I don't care what it is. If it takes my time, if it takes my money, if it, I'm moving everything. I'm making a straight path for him. If we do that, that highway for our God, our God will come to where we are, and he will lead us out of where we are into his presence. And when we started off, they were crying out from him, wondering, why don't you answer? He's showing us here that he wants to answer. And then he begins to cry out to you and say, oh, my love, my love, oh, I want to comfort you. I want to comfort you. I want to let you know that you're my people. Every valley should be raised up. Every mountain and hill made low. And the rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. I want his glory to be revealed. I want to see his glory. Matter of fact, think of the statement I made to you a moment ago. About us call on me. Call and I will show you great and mighty things. Do you want to see things beyond the things for your life? you want to see into the heavenlies? Do you want to see your master? Do you want to see, have celestial encounters? Do you want to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit? Do you want to be filled with the mightiness of God's presence and fellowship and power and gifts? He says, call upon me, and I'll show you great and mighty things. But if we're going to call upon him, we must understand that he has set a way. He says, I want you to clean up your act and realize no more pouting, no more being a little child. I want you to come out of your mother's presence being a weaned child and come and be in my presence and let me train you how to be a person of God. I want to take you down and deep into the river of life where it's just me and you. Not some religious stuff going on. Not a social club. I want to isolate you with myself so I can teach you my ways and impart to you vision to heal your blindness. I want to strengthen your legs on the pathways that you'll walk with me. I'm calling you to myself. I want you to know me intimately. I want to take you into the hidden places in the recesses of my river where it's just you and I. No pouting. No false communications. No manipulations. No haughtiness. I'll be watching your eyes. I'll come to you daily and see what you're doing in your earthly relationships. Get those fixed because I'm coming. Shall we pray? Lord, how great you are. And what an offer you have for us to come and be in the river of life with you. A special offer. Presented with tender compassion and comfort of you calling us to yourself. We've been up in the shallow water and we've been crying. Oh, how we need more. Oh, how we need more. Help us see in our mind every person that we have tied up like that puppy. Every person we have duct taped. Every person that we have control and manipulation over. Because we must go loose them and get rid of our pointing finger. We must get rid of all our malicious talk because we want an encounter with you. I am willing to do such. I make commitment to do such because I need you, my God. I cannot live without you. I cannot live without the rushing water. It is exhilarating. It is my life. So, oh God, I lay these things before you and state, I will do these things. I desire to have encounters with you. I desire and I call upon you to show me great and mighty things. In Jesus' name I pray. I pray for your people. That their hearts would swell and desire that you would show them great and mighty things.
Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that little sermon is via our Lord during the break. I went to the restroom and looked in the mirror, and he said, I want you to tell this story and this story, and I want you to go back and get Isaiah 58 and Isaiah 40, and I'll tell you what to say. <laughs> he is faithful, is he not? With that, we're going to pass the microphone around and give you an opportunity. What did the Lord speak to you? What did you get out of the directives or the message that's been laid before you? Just yesterday, Sherry and Gary and I were sitting at the kitchen table reading Isaiah 58 and talking about the promise that's in it. So much promise. And oh, I how. F I forgot to read that. <laughs> How faithful he is to raise up the foundation of many generations. Yes, and it's is. all, if we will, he will. If we will, he will. He is faithful. Anyone else? What did you get out of the message? It is interesting to me that you would speak on Isaiah 58. It's a night I'm actually here. <laughs> Isaiah 58 is the name of a ministry that we're in the process of starting and um, because that's really what it's all about and uh, uh, we're running the, the Shepherd's Heart Care Center slash food bank in Lyman and Christian Ministry Network which I'm a board member is the overseeing organization of that but Isaiah 58 is a new ministry rising up to take over that ministry of the Shepherd's Heart Care Center. And this is the Shepherd's Heart that you see here, that kind of a ministry. But Isaiah 58 is the name we've chosen for that. And um, we're in a place where there is so much brokenness and so much bondage and so much problems and so much the pointing of the finger and that is really our heart's desire I mean it's not only feeding the people but it's a spiritual ministry and that is our heart's desire and that's what we're working with because we want to be the restorer of the breach and um, another interesting thing to me as you were reading about um, here and I hadn't really seen it before the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard so often Christians want to face the glory they want to look for the glory instead of the God of the glory and we're to be walking with him and the armor we have is all for forward the glory is our rear guard which is entirely we want to face the glory but no that's coming behind us we need to be walking with our Lord and that's where we need to have our focus is on him. Anyone else? What did the Lord show you in the midst of the message? Elton? You'll be thinking. Next person. Uh, Pastor, he showed me two things. Um, one was the fact that Jesus Christ, as um, he, he fulfilled all of his call as a man, from the very beginning, not just the last three and a half years of his life, but all of that leading up to that, and uh, his call is our call, and uh, and he fulfilled that for us to show us that it can be done. And then secondly, um, I was taken by the fact that when bad things come out of my mouth, or uh, the pointing of the finger, or my relationships aren't right, or the rising of the eye, I'm like, oh yeah. Um, God just leaves. He, there's, it's not like any other response, but He's not there any longer. And and then it's up to me to. Where's God? <laughs> well, He left because of what I did, and repenting and turning from that, and calling upon His name to restore the relationship. But just the fact that He, He just leaves and uh, that impressed me tonight mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
Who's next? Check on. The one thing that you um, said about untie the cords of the yoke and the way that you put that, you said um, what I expect out of you is being a yoke. Um, I, you know, it was just that really hit me because um, I've been on the, the other end of that. I've been on what other people expect from me and I know how oppressive that is especially because I cannot live up to it you know like especially being a pastor's wife people expect certain things out of you and and you know you can't live up to all of them because everybody's expectations are different there's some things that I have to you know do it in my role but when it's it's one thing when I'm trying to go along and do it um, or trying to be what I need to be for everybody, it, it's one thing. But when I when I when other people expect it, it's 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 a, it's almost oppressive. And it when I was um, when you were saying that, I I thought I know that feeling of being oppressed, of being under someone else's yoke, and I certainly don't want to to ever do that to somebody else because I know the feeling and it just really made me want to um, double check my own heart to see Lord please show me if I'm ex expecting other people to do something or expecting them to to you know whatever it is to give to help to support to you know I don't want to to have that yoke on somebody else um, and I just I just want to really check my double check my heart my motives my you know my, so that I don't have that anyone else would the Lord speak to you in the midst of the message can I ask a question yeah um, okay so I'm sort of confused um so I'm to expect nothing of you? Is that what you're saying? I mean, I'm hearing Jackie talk about the weight of being a pastor's wife and people, I guess, putting things on on you, Jackie. You're thinking you're supposed to perform or something. But should I not expect you, my pastor, to be above reproach? Should I not expect you to be holy? Or am I missing something here? No. Okay. As, as a pastor, that is what's expected of me that's what my God expects of me and if I'm not then uh, you're supposed to approach me with the language of our God and say oh brother uh, this is an offense before the Lord I think don't you think this doesn't match scripture and and you take me into scripture and you show me where the error is so that I can uh, change directions because if it's in scripture I need to change directions if it's personal preference and there's the problem we get our personal preference so confined that we try to use scripture to manipulate others into our personal preference. But, uh, no, it's not an oppression for you to expect me to be a shepherd. If I'm stating I'm a shepherd, I'm the Lord's representative. You're supposed to inspect all the nuts and bolts and under it and raise the hood, and you're supposed to look. And I realize every pastor I've ever met says, oh, get close to the sheep I'll let them look under the hood I might find something wrong and I'm thinking well if there's something wrong I want to know something's wrong I want to move closer to my God I'm in this for my God not trying to round up a bunch of sheep I have a personal walk that I have to maintain with God in order to lead you and now where leadership fails is they fail to see they're supposed to have that personal walk and an appointment from him to do such there's too many of us say God said and go try to do things and that's not God God is the one that appoints us we've we've covered those so uh, yes it's, it is not ridicule uh, I, I, if any of you are in disagreement you're supposed to uh, state your disagreements after the meeting to me if it's disruptive to others if it's just confusion on your part then you're supposed to say Pastor, I'm confused about this. Can can you 
tell me because I, I think scripture says this or or I don't know scripture or where do you get that from? Because there's many heavy teachings that people have problems with. Do you realize Jesus looked at his disciples and, and there's a whole flock of them there and he says, this is my blood. You're going to drink it. Oh, my God. He's finally gone off the deep end. This is my body. You're going to eat my flesh. <laughs> oh. and, they, and most of them left except for 12. He said, will you leave too? See, there's teachings in the word that people will not accept. I don't have any problem with that. If it's somebody challenged me that we're not supposed to drink his blood, I'd say, I'm sorry, but it's right there. And that's what it is. He said it was he was God and he said it was his blood. I don't care if you think it's grape juice. He said it's blood and he's God. He's right. You're wrong. <laughs> and I don't have to get nasty. I don't have to manipulate you. I can just hold my finger, you know, right here. Now, if it says somewhere else that it was grape juice, I'll be in agreement with you. But we're supposed to all get on the same page with the word, are we not? Where there's total peace. Jesus was total peace with his father. His father had all the answers. New scripture inside out. He's the one that wrote it. Jesus knew it inside out because his father wrote it. Did I answer your question? Pat, forgive me, Pat Durkin. Um, I have repeatedly told him that I would be down to his house at a time, and I'm never there at that time. He expects to see me, and I don't show up. And it would seem to me that that's kind of the expecting we're to have with one another. If we say we're gonna, we should, and if we can't, we should take the time to explain the position and see if that's okay with them and if it isn't then go to something else so oh sure sorry about that pat jackie yeah just as clarification i, I wasn't i have not felt this way with any of you all in this room and but, but it just in times past um i have i i know what that what that feels like and it's not an expectation of who i'm supposed to be Kristen. in my relationship with the Lord, but an expectation of how I'm supposed to perform or, you know, what I'm supposed to look like or act like. or So it, it's, it has more to do with what Curtis said, of what people's personal preferences of where what I should be doing is, not where they are on a, um, a friendship level, you know. And that's all I meant. But. Anyone else? What else did you get out of the teaching? Would the Lord speak to you? Last call. You'll be thinking. I, what I got is I have a whole lot of homework to do. <laughs> <laughs> I've been doing a lot of homework, but I have a lot more ahead of me. But at least it's it's becoming clear what steps I need to take. And it's what's helping me is... Uh, well, everything you had to say, but uh, I'm just feeling freed up more and more each week, I guess. And uh, when you're talking about the boy at age 12 becoming the man at age 13, or going into under the care of the man and leaving the mother's presence, well, um, that applies to me personally uh, because of the oppression I was under under my mother in our family and um i'm still not completely free of that bondage and so it was really wonderful to hear that um you know once once i let go of my mother's presence then i will be in the lord's presence and it was just kind of like a a, a key piece to hear tonight cool anyone else work up here in front. <clears throat> Who's next after Mark? What I discovered was it's not only a different kind of fast than anything I've ever heard of, but it's a fast we do every day. It's supposed to, yes. Not like a read back and forth. Right. And forth. But it doesn't incorporate 
a fast of no water or juice. It's, it's different than the physical fast we always think of. And yet it's something that we do every day. I've never heard that. Ever. Praise God. But I heard it tonight. <laughs> Amen. Anyone else? What else the Lord speak to you? Diane. Anyone else on this side over here? Y'all get your thinking caps on. I agree, Mark. I, I really believe that to, to let the oppressed go free, we cannot hold anybody in our judgment. We cannot hold a judgment against anybody. And we cannot have an unreasonable expectation against anybody because it puts them in bondage, but it also puts us in bondage. Because the, we're, we're expecting, we're, we're watching for and expecting a response. And all it does is catch you up in a goat rope that you can't fix. Well, I, you know, I agree with that. I do. If we're talking about, uh, let, let's do for some clarification now. Yeah. In general living, um, if we lived in community with one another, if we li we do, I mean, we do on two or three or four, sometimes five days a week. But if we lived in an, in in the same house, there would be a common courtesy afforded one another. Right. There must be a common respect for one another. There must be a, a a heart that desires to have fellowship and to hear and to be a servant toward one another. If those things are not there then there's a something's awry something's askew and the holy spirit can't take the freedom that we would then walk in to express the lord i i i just i just see a i really see that we can get hung up here and we don't want to get hung up here i have been with my own children really having an expectation and until a few years ago i finally just said lord they belong to you. I need to respond out of your heart to them. I can't respond out of what I think or what I feel or what I believe. I have to respond out of the Father's heart. The simplest thing to do is always keep in focus. Jesus is standing next to me. Yes, yes. If he's there, my response is going to be different. If I'm conscious of him there... My response is always going to be right. Anyone else? Yes, Tristan. I feel like I've had some, I've had my yoke that I've put on people. Knowing, and I don't even know if they realize that I've put it on them. But just, I know that I have. My expectations of others haven't been right. And they've only served to get me tangled up in my own mess. Not just release those. I'm sorry. Amen. Amen. Yeah. yeah. Message is not meant to excuse sin. Remember, we started out, it said that we need to do away with sin. That's not what we're excusing when we're talking about being kind and gentle. If someone steps on my toe, intentionally I have to say uh, pardon me sir but you're on my toe I'm not supposed to be silent about it am I now if I I said you you know wormy bag of maggots what are you doing standing on my foot now Jesus just withdrew <laughs> even if there was intent so uh, we can talk about those other perimeters uh, concerning how we're supposed to respond to each other at uh, another time uh, we'd like to stay on focus about what the Lord spoke to you out of the message. Anyone else? Last call. Gary? Um, the interesting thing I felt was uh, Jesus was a boy and then he was a man. There was no comment about him ever being a teenager. <laughs> and uh, I think that should be taught on based, you know. I, I don't think there was any time he was a teenager. No, so, yeah. you, you became a man when you were 13. He passed into manhood, and you were expected to do the things a man did. And today, children are not trained in how to be men. And, of course, they're supposed to receive that training when they're with their moms. Okay, you're going to be a man on this date, you know. 
and, and, and teaching and responsibility and all that stuff. I uh, guess I could talk to you all night long about these things. Any other comments? A uh, point of order for us to think about. Uh, how many of y'all have ever been down in this room in the middle of the week on a weekend and received ministry? Would you raise your hand? I want y'all to look around. Keep your hand up. Anybody that's been in this room received ministry during the week? Uh, yeah, everybody looking? The reason I want to point this out to you is because the Lord said, I heard you grumble about taking down the furniture and putting it back up. He said, I want you to know I minister here during the week and you're the ones that facilitate that. Good for thought? You don't put the furniture up for Jackie and I and put it up so the Lord can do ministry work here. May the Lord bless you. <laughs> yes? And maybe provide books on Wednesday night. <laughs> oh, that, that's right. Uh, I guess a couple other announcements. Oh, there's uh, we got Proverbs next Saturday, which will you know really be on bead Thursday Friday and all that stuff of being preparing for it in Saturday uh, we'd love to have your help and your assistance in that I know that Diane cans for everybody she's gone over her and Jerry and got a truckload of food and I'm sure you're going to be receiving some sometime or another through the year she prepares half the meals for this body if you have time this week Make arrangements and go help her. She's got a truckload of fruit over there. She canned it and she gives it away by the case. Help her in that. Anyone else? Any other comments? Okay, for cooking, why don't you check with Joni and Diane if you'd like to assist. I know they carry most of the burden. Jackie doesn't have time to do this. She's preparing the house. She's preparing the music. I don't have time. I'm preparing the word. So we're supposed to train you in works of service. And so these are real ministries of Diane and Joni ministering to you as the body. And many of you have helped. I mean, you all are a great body. You are. I just, I love you to death. I, I just think you're, you throw my heart. God really has done something in moving us up here because of you. That was one thing I wept about when we left the South is all the relationships and the deep abiding. There's something that happens when you go deep with somebody in the Lord. And there's trusting relationships that are built there. It's beyond any other type of relationship. And I, so I just, I just delight in you. I love you to pieces. Any other comments that we need to make? Uh, well, that's going to be after Proverbs, right? Yeah, we're going to be starting women's Bible study on a Tuesday morning. And that'll be after Proverbs 31. Be on the 22nd will be the first meeting. And you ought to rejoice for others. <laughs> and... You're going to be at doing a Beth Moore study. 10 o'clock, Tuesday the 22nd. Is there any other announcements I haven't made? Um, a prayer group. But that's probably the body to decide when to start up a prayer group like we used to. Uh, no, we, we, we plan on doing that. We did. Gary's house at Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him, he's smiling. He took that with a grin. <laughs> now, I, I, I've been in prayer about that. We used to meet in the mornings on prayer. Uh, we've been so busy trained to get the radio station in and to get past that and, and the summer things. There's just a few things we've got left on the summer things. And I've desperately, Mom's been here for two months, and I've got to spend two days with her so far. Two. 
thing seems to always come up. I, I would like to, oh, I wanted to make the announcement. I, I'm going to, Jackie and I are going to start taking off uh, Mondays, or Sundays and Mondays. So if you can do your, <laughs> we have to, I have to, I have to minister to my wife. And I need some time to minister to my mom and her to minister to my soul too. I find um, my radiator's running low. <laughs> So with that, if, if you have an emergency, you can call me. But if it's something that will keep, um, please keep in mind, I need some time with the Lord too. Or just being teacher bleed. <laughs> 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 I saw my mother sometimes. When we're talking emergency and emergency with teacher bleed. <laughs> yes. Also, if you make that decision, I mean, I don't know how short time, but. It's, it's been a long time since I've had some time off. You know, we went to the other side, but that ended up being, you know, entertaining and taking care of someone else. It was not a sit and relax time. And uh, I, I don't relax when someone's around. I want to minister. It's in me. I instantly, I mean, uh, you, you, Jack gets up every morning. He goes to the window. He's a guard dog. And he, he's just a squirrel, you know. <laughs> when one of the sheep comes around, I'm, I'm looking. Are you, are you okay? And I'm looking at the Lord, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing what a shepherd does. I can't keep from doing that. So I might pass the word to anyone that's not here, if you would, so that we don't get any surprise visits during that time or calls or anything like that. And uh, Anyway, is there anything else? I don't want to let you go. <laughs> With that, we'd like to thank the people for joining us in tech. all Get in the aisle and wave at these people. Just stand up, get in the aisle, and wave at them. <laughs> Go back the other way. <laughs> Love y'all. Thank y'all for joining us. Go back the other way, Pat. Go over there. The other side. The other side. Okay, y'all get ready. You ready? Okay, everybody. God bless you, Butch, Brenda, Chester, Terrell, Pam, Craig, Bob. We just love you to pieces, Bob. God bless you. I hope you're uh, getting ready to ship us uh, 200 pounds of crab. <laughs> love you. Bye, Bob. <laughs>